So I'll try to start right on uh, time. I've actually got like five TL cells. So I'll start us exactly at 10. I'm gonna mute until then. So welcome to our series on uh, Faroe Lectures, uh, seminars on the fundamental properties and understanding of ferroelectrics and related materials. And um, I'm uh, Ron Cohen, Ronald Cohen from the Carnegie Institution for Science. And uh, today we're really excited to have, oops, I should say before I go on, about today's lecture, uh, I wanna thank the organizing committee that's behind these lectures and without their help, uh, these would not happen. You may just see me as the face of this uh, series, but these are the people that are really uh, working to uh, put together a really exciting program uh, each month. 
So we have these talks on uh, 10 a.m. Eastern Time, uh, U.S. Eastern Time uh, on the second Thursday of each month. So I want to thank uh, Laurent Belaish, uh, Cyrus Dreyer, Jorge Iniguez, and uh, Beth uh, Noadnik for uh, helping with this. So today we're really excited to have Lane Martin uh, speak. Uh, and it's really uh, interesting uh, subject matter to me because uh, who knew that there were still exciting things to be done with barium titanate. So I, I think the title might be, don't call it a comeback. I, 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 sorry if I dropped the don't here. <laughs> so so, um, so uh, I would call it a comeback, but anyway, <laughs> so uh, he's at, uh, 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 Lane Martin, Professor Martin is at UC Berkeley and at uh, Lawrence Berkeley National Lab. And uh, he's uh, Chancellor's Professor and Chair of the um, Department of Material Science and Engineering at Berkeley and a, a Senior Scientist in the Materials Division at Lawrence Berkeley uh, National Laboratory. Uh, and uh, he got his PhD actually in Berkeley uh, uh, some years ago, not that long ago. and. Um, and he's a really uh, exciting uh, uh, experimentalist who does uh, really interesting things uh, in the lab, but uh, with, uh, uh, with an outlook to understand exactly what's going on on the uh, fundamental level in materials. And uh, this is not the subject of what he's going to talk about today, but some of his papers like these two have like, uh, uh, like 1,500 or so citations already. Uh, there's a large group of co uh, collaborative uh, researchers, but really exciting stuff on using uh, uh, properties of ferroelectrics and multiferroics in interesting ways. And I want you to, I encourage you to look at these papers and others if you're uh, excited by today's talk. So, uh, so with that, I think we're gonna go ahead and turn it over to uh, Lane, who will uh, speak uh, and then there'll be uh, questions afterwards. So please type your questions in the question uh, panel on your um, uh, Zoom app. And, uh, and uh, you can type them in during the talk, that's fine. And then we'll uh, address them afterwards. So, uh, so with that, I will turn it over to Lane. Great, thanks. Uh, thanks, Ron. And, and thank you everybody on the organizing committee for uh, the invitation uh, to be here. And um, just let me get all the appropriate screens where they need to be. Um, okay, so yeah, thanks everybody. It's exciting to be here uh, virtually. Um, uh, I think, you know, Ron did a good job kind of setting, setting the table for us, right? I, I mean, Sometimes when I work on these materials, I ask myself, I mean, really, is there anything new to be done in these? And I think the answer is always yes, right? We always we have new approaches, be they you know theoretical or, or computational or characterization or synthesis that, that when we apply to these kind of classic systems, there's always something good to learn about them. They really are kind of, you know, important uh, bellwethers for us. So um, so I gave this kind of this cheeky uh, uh, title here, don't call it a comeback for, for barium titanate, but um, you know, let's jump into it and kind of kind of get rolling. Um, okay, so uh, before we do that, let me first you know, acknowledge the folks who actually do all the actual hard work and, and important work for, for this, uh, you know, for these kinds of scientific endeavors that we're pushing. Uh, we have a great group here uh, at Berkeley, a number of postdocs and students, um, lots of great former members. Uh, maybe you'll see some of their work here as well. Uh, some great collaborators here uh, at LBL and UC Berkeley and around the country and around the world. Uh, and of course, we're always thankful for those folks who, who, who pay the bills for these kinds of things as well. So as we go through, keep in mind that these are the real you know, uh, uh, contributors here to this work. Okay, so um, as I said, you know, we wanna get started with uh, you know, barium titanate here and it's, it's an oldie but a goodie. And uh, I also wanted to maybe make, you know, the only reference to LL Cool J in a Fairelectrics talk you've ever heard uh, and quote his famous line from Mama said, knock you out. Don't call it a comeback. I've been here for years. I'm rocking my peers. And barium titanate, I think, really lives up to this this kind of stance, right? Uh, it has been and remains one of the most important ferroelectrics, and and I think it has you know some potential to to come back into to to highlight here. So, uh, you know, I want to just point out, you know, we've had 101 years of ferroelectricity. Uh, and, and this has given us a huge number of really exciting materials and and 
if you haven't looked at it already, uh, the wonderful APL materials celebration of the 100 years an anniversary for fair electricity. Uh, check it out. There's a lot of really great stuff there, and it'll give you a nice perspective of, of all these sorts of things. Um, and you know, perhaps no more famous and influential fair electric material uh, than than barium titanate itself, right? You know, discovered all the way back in you know the early 1940s, simultaneously in in three different places around the world, uh, and and really has played an important role since. So we've had you know over 81 years of of barium titanate at this point. Uh, and if you look at that history, uh, it's really a who's who of researchers in our field who have done uh, important and, and exciting work with this material. Uh, and at the same time, it has served as really a test bed for the fundamental understanding and applications alike in our in our field. Uh, and you know, has provided I, I would say timeless examples of of the phenomena and function of ferroelectrics. And I just pulled a few of the things here in terms of, you know, looking at phase transformations and evolution of of the lattice with these systems, looking at domain formation in these materials, and even. Uh, you know, applications as like a multi-layer capacitor structure. And if you've ever checked it out, there's actually uh, a very nice, uh, succinct kind of review of the history of, of, of barium titanate by Clive Randall and uh, Bob Noonan and, and Eric Cross and company from 2009. That, that's really nice. You can find it online. Uh, it's part of ceramics.org. Um, okay, so what I want to ask today is, you know, really what's achievable in these classic materials if we apply these kind of modern understanding things in control that we have today. And, you know, really ask the question, like Ron was saying, is do we know all there is to know about these materials? And, and I think we're, there's always something more to learn. So I'm going to show you two little vignettes today as we go through. Uh, the first is, you know, how we can kind of push the envelope for these materials. And really, you know, this is a challenge for us as materials makers. You know, how good can we make these materials? How good can we make barium titanate? And there's a lot of data shown here, and we're going to go into it in detail, where we're comparing kind of everything that's been done in epitaxial films of barium titanate in the system. And we're really trying to push for, you know, small uh, course of fields and course of voltages, small work, uh, work of switching, uh, maybe non-traditional scaling behavior, fast switching, all these sorts of things. And we're, and we're really thinking about using these things in devices. And in the second vignette, uh, we'll take a look at how using kind of super lattice approaches uh, and building up these artificial heterostructures in these materials can produce exotic new kind of behavior. And, and we've seen a lot of this in recent years. And, and today we'll try to focus in a little bit on uh, some, the emergence of what looks like relaxer behavior inside of these materials as well. Okay, so let's start with the first one, just good old fashioned barium titanate by itself. <clears throat> now, we and many others in the field are being strongly motivated uh, by a need to enable new kinds of devices that will uh, allow us to perhaps lower the energy cost of doing computation in the future. And, and ferroelectrics are really uh, a candidate material in this class, uh, in this in this uh, sense right now. And so this is where we're coming at this. And so I think we're all quite familiar with the concept of Moore's law, right? This idea uh, that has really kind of uh, been the underpinnings of the modern microelectronics world, where we can double the transistors on an integrated circuit every you know one or two years. Um, you know that comes out to some compounded annual growth rate for for the number of transistors. But, you know, starting around 2005, uh, our transistor density, you know, increase started to slow down a little bit. Uh, less heralded, but perhaps more important uh, for the current problems is something called Denard scaling. So uh, this is kind of a corollary law, which talks about all the actual business end of how do we get this done, including, you know, what's the performance per watt uh, for uh, these computations. And this uh, was supposed to double every 18 months, okay? Uh, and it basically describes the scaling of transistor dimensions, area, circuit delays, and operating frequencies. But it has a strong requirement that we keep the uh, electric field constant while we do these sorts of things, which means that the voltage has to be reduced by 30% in every generation, uh, and therefore reducing energy by uh, 65 to 50, 65% uh, and power by 50%. Now, as we've decreased the size of our uh, uh, integrated circuit transistors uh, here in the red curve like this, we've seen that the power has gone up dramatically. So we have not been doing a good job at following Denard scaling. So since about 2005 to 2007, depending on who you talk to, uh, you know, 
we stopped being able to follow along this Denard scaling law and started to deviate further and further away from this uh, if you look at the drive voltages. So they just stopped going down at the rates we wanted. And this has led to a massive effort that many have uh, been hearing about, which is you know, to try to consider alternatives to the traditional approaches to doing these sorts of things. So looking at spin and electric field, ton uh, electron tunneling and fair electric strain, phase change, all these sorts of things. And there's uh, wonderful programs happening all over the world looking at these sorts of things. And I think we as material scientists and engineers, you know, have a have a role to play here in, in helping us come up with the right kinds of materials to enable this kind of ultra low voltage computational uh, uh, approach. Uh, and this is where we're coming in. This is why we're working on these sorts of materials. So fair electrics, as I mentioned, are being considered in this in this uh, context for these next generation microelectronics. And they're interesting because they have kind of the built in non volatility. Uh, you can have the potential for low voltages or low switching energies in these systems. You can have relatively high switching speeds. Um, but how do we pick the right material? We got all these cool materials that are floating out there. And so you can go back to even good old fashioned kind of single crystal data, you know, uh, classic data for these systems. Uh, and, you know, I've picked just a handful of different materials from the PZT system, BFO, barium titanate, even some of the relaxer type, type materials. Uh, and when you do this and you look at the, at the results, you know, what you see is that barium titanate has some really interesting kind of properties just from a, a, a you know, first glance, right? It has low coercive field, it has low switching energy. And when you compare this even to say some of the relaxer materials that are uh, nearby, uh, it, it performs quite well. Now, the, uh, so barium titanate, low coercive field, low switching energy, seems like a reasonable thing to consider in this regard. Now, the problem has been that while we've been growing thin films for, for many, many decades at this point of barium titanate, we generally find uh, that while we can make the films, um, the course of field goes up quite a bit by, you know, maybe 100 times, you know, in, in some cases, uh, and the remnant polarization often goes down and can be in some films close to zero in these systems. And so this is a problem, right? We can't have zero remnant polarization uh, and large course of fields in these uh, systems. And I've just pulled a few examples of, of, of films uh, to, to kind of give examples of, of the difference here. So, you know, we wanted to ask the question, uh, you know, is it possible to make films as good as single crystals and, and really kind of, uh, you know, get the most out of these materials that we can? All right, so what can we achieve? So let's start with the kind of summary of where we're at. So this is uh, the remnant polarization on the vertical axis and the coercive voltage of the uh, ferroelectric hysteresis loop uh, for our work here, these uh, top few uh, data point types, which are primarily in this green square here, uh, and a whole bunch of data we pulled from the literature for epitaxial barium titanate films. So what we've done is come up with an approach that gives us a, an ability to really create the combination of things we want, low coercive field and a reasonable remnant polarization in this, in this system. Depending on who you talk to in industry, you probably want this in you know, five, 10 uh, microcoulombs per centimeter squared at a minimum for these sorts of things. Uh, we have found that there is a very sensitive uh, pressure dependence uh, to the production of these sorts of things and to get the lowest course of fields and voltages, something that is approaching the single crystal values, you really have to focus in on getting these the growth right. We'll talk about what, where that comes from. Um, now, what we found is that there's some very simple key indicators to producing the, the best materials. And so this is just X-ray diffraction, intensity on the vertical axis, theta two theta on the uh, um, uh, horizontal axis here. And what we found is that if we calculate you know, the bulk lattice parameter where that should be and the strained peak position, let's say we're growing the strained on some oxide substrate, here we're using gadolinium scandate uh, substrates, uh, Often when we grow these materials, there's an expansion of the lattice uh, relative to the expectation of this system. And when we do this, this is when we often get much larger coercive fields. But if you work with things like pressure and even relatively small changes in the pressure can cause large changes in the lattice parameter of the system. And when we get to the kind of perfect bulk-like value or you know, expectation uh, of value, we get the best properties. But it's not unlimited, right? We can go a little bit further and actually the properties get a little bit worse in these systems. But we found this structural uh, uh, idea to be a very simple kind of in indicator or metric for what's happening. And I can summarize this for you very quickly. This is um, 
the expansion of the lattice parameter, so delta L over L, so whatever my C-axis lattice parameter is over what it's supposed to be, uh, as a function of coercive field for the system. So generally what you see is the larger the expansion of the lattice, the larger the coercive field is in the system. And again, you know, most of the materials that we've been able to make are down here in this corner where we want to be. So small change in lattice parameter and uh, you know, low coercive field in the system. So really kind of exciting uh, approaches. So I think the real question then is what does it take to make an ideal uh, film? You know, what does this thing look like in these in the system? All right, so there's a bunch of stuff we have to get right to make this kind of work. Uh, and so let me just walk you through what we've kind of discovered. Uh, so the first is, um, you know, you have to get the structure right. This is what we were saying. This is probably one of the most key indicators. And if you get this right, kind of the other things are going to follow uh, suit as you go through it. Um, so we have to have this x-ray peak kind of exactly where we're supposed to be. I didn't put it in here, but we've seen previously that you can actually tune the expansion in this by by many percent. We've had, you know, expanded uh, uh, barium titanate lattice in films as much as four, five, six percent. Uh, if you want, it's still single phase barium titanate. It's just greatly expanded because of defects and things like this in the film. So you have to get these things right. And when you do this, you'll get a very high quality film in, in this system. Now, the second thing you have to keep in mind is the chemistry, right? We want to have this thing as close to kind of ideal bulk like as you can. Uh, and so we've done a lot of work looking at, you know, how things like the growth parameters impact the um, composition of these materials. In this case, we did some Rutherford backscattering spectrometry to kind of nail this down. And within the kind of, you know, plus or minus one, you know, one atom percent for the system. Uh, the RBS tells us that these films, when we get the ideal kind of properties, uh, are one-to-one -one barium to titanium in the system. Another big thing is the electrodes in these materials. And we've spent a lot of time um, really fiddling with the electrodes to figure out how to get us the, the best interfaces and the best connections with the kind of outside world to measure these, these properties. And what we're finding is that you really have to get about as idea, uh, identical as possible when you make both your bottom and top electrodes for these capacitor structures. And this is particularly interest, uh, important when we get to very thin films, which is where we're going. Uh, and so we have developed symmetric uh, uh, tri-layer structures where we have a bottom electrode of like uh, strontium ruthenate or, or barium strontium ruthenate and a top electrode of the same material. Uh, but what we find is that we have to grow them in situ at the same time to get these sorts of things. We can grow you know, bottom electrode, bare electric, and then do the top electrode ex situ after the fact. We can get low coercive fields, but we get shifts in the loops. But if you do everything in situ, you can uh, get this kind of idealized fair electric switching behavior that you want. And this has led us to have to develop, you know, interesting wet edge processes and other kind of low impact processes to get these things to work. And then finally, you know, as we kind of zoom in back uh, to this material, we, we want to have really high quality interfaces. And this comes from all the other stuff that we've talked about, having the structure and chemistry and electrodes right. Um, but in particular, as we make these films thin, I think this is probably a 25 nanometer thick film or something in that ballpark, these interfaces play an increasingly important role. And this is not anything new. I think we've known this for a long time, but we really have to pay attention to making kind of pristine interfaces. And I think there's still lots we can do in this regard as a community to make it better. Okay, so structure, chemistry, electrodes, interfaces, all these things have to be there. Now, what about the properties for these systems? Well, if you do it, this is what we get. This is for a 100 nanometer thick film. Uh, you can see uh, the course of uh, voltage and course of field for the system. It's not quite all the way to bulk, but we're starting to get closer and closer in these, in these systems. Uh, we have symmetric uh, hysteresis loops, strong remnant polarization, strong, strong saturation polarization. There's no fatigue in these systems out to 10 to, the nine, uh, 10 to the 9 cycles. This is well known if we use these oxide electrodes, nothing new here, just kind of you know, showing the, the the data. And likewise, we have strong retention. There, there's no loss of the states in these and they last for very, very long times in, uh, uh, in the same state we put them in. So materials are behaving well. Um, now we really wanted to try to push it. So how do we how do we make this thing go a little bit further? So we had this optimized growth. I think we've got less defects, you know, less domain wall pinning, all these kind of stuff happening in the material. But you know, can we really push this down and down and down to really thin films, which is what we'll actually want to have for, for applications down the line. All right, so we've looked at a thickness uh, uh, series for these systems. Here was the 100 nanometer film I showed you before, and then we're going to thin this thing down uh, all the way down to about 12 and a half nanometers in the system. Okay, so we apply this, looks pretty good. 
until we get about maybe 25 nanometers, where at this point, we start to have a great reduction in the remnant polarization inside of the system. You can see there's a lot of data here, but uh, this yellow curve here. And then by the time we hit the 12 and a half nanometers, we have very, very little remnant polarization left in these systems. Now, the good news is the coercive voltage is getting below 100 uh, millivolts, which is kind of one of the metrics that industry is giving us. Um, you know, in a reasonable range of thicknesses, you know, even at, at 50 nanometer film thicknesses, we're in this ballpark already. Now, we can also uh, calculate the work of switching, which is just these, the area inside this hysteresis loop. Uh, and again, we did this for, for our films and a bunch of the, you know, epitaxial films for a barium titanate and single crystals and also PZT from the literature. Uh, and again, we see kind of different bins of, of, of behavior in these systems. So PZT and barium titanate, and then our current work is down here. Now, not all of these are going to be functionally useful. Some have too low remnant polarization, but there's probably some here in the middle, which are, are giving us what we want. It's combination of low switching uh, energy and low course of field with a reasonable remnant polarization. Now, as we looked at this a little bit more carefully, this is where interesting things started to happen. Uh, and we looked at the course of field scaling for this system. Uh, so this is the course of field. That's this top data here. This is the course of voltage. This is the bottom data here. And what we found is that the course of field scaling is essentially flat once we go below about 125 nanometers. And it actually deviates from the very classical observation from John of K, uh, K. Dunlaw and, and, and scaling, which says that this you know, course of uh, voltage should scale with the film thickness to the minus two thirds uh, power in these materials. Now, uh, at thicknesses above about 125 nanometers, it fits quite well to these sorts of uh, this JKD scaling, but below this value, it does not. All right. so you know, what's the reason for this relatively convenient deviation from scaling? Because this is helping us keep our course of voltages down. Now, it turns out that uh, understanding this deviation is something that, you know, people have seen before, right? It's not the first time it's been seen in polymers and fluorite systems and a whole bunch of other systems over the years. And people have put the, down uh, kind of nice ideas for, for how to deal with this. Um, and one of the things you can do is, you know, adjust for imperfections or imperfect screening from our electrodes and our systems. There's a very nice paper from, from Matt Dauber and company uh, from earlier uh, in the 2000s, which kind of, you know, laid out the, the formalism for doing these sorts of things. And basically you can, you know, uh, estimate screening lengths and estimate the dielectric constants of your electrodes and, and correct for this kind of imperfect screening, which gives rise to depolarization fields in these systems. Now, we know we're using strontium ruthenate, which helps us with things like fatigue and, and, and these sorts of things, but it also is not quite as good as like a, a good metal like platinum or gold or something like this. And so it uh, has an effectively larger uh, dielectric constant than those materials would. And so if we take reasonable values for these sorts of things uh, uh, from the literature, uh, for the screening lengths and for the dielectric constant, we can actually uh, take our... Um, you know, kind of as received data and correct it for this depolarization field. And it will end up matching JKD scaling if you deal with the depolarization fields in these systems, right? So what we're having is the same things we people have seen before. We have depolarization that's turning on in these systems. It's happening at a slightly thicker films than we anticipated, uh, but it's giving us a benefit, which is that there's this regime in the middle where we get low course of field relative to what we would expect uh, from JKD scaling because of this uh, additional depolarization field. Okay, now this can also do other stuff. It could also be affecting the stability of the, of the polarization. And we also showed that there was this very strong thickness dependence of the remnant polarization. Remember, as we decrease the thickness, this polarization value came way down and that's a, that's a problem for us too. And this is exactly what's happening. Uh, even though these are all grown on the same strain state, okay, they're all coherently strained films. If we go from 100 nanometers to 50 nanometers to 25 nanometers to 12 and a half nanometers, and you look at the dielectric constant as a function of temperature, we see that the transition temperature where you get the maximum in this, in this behavior is going down and down and down, right? So the depolarization is so strong in these materials that it's effectively, you know, starting to turn the polarization off. And even at thicknesses of you know, 150 nanometers, we're seeing strong impacts in this regard. So the TC is going down as the thickness goes down in these materials at a you know, at, at much thicker films than I might have expected from you know, kind of a naive picture of this. But it is, ends up being quite consistent with the literature. And, and I, here I, I, I pull a quote from you know, um, 
Javier Junquera's uh, very seminal nature paper from 2003, uh, where they kind of, you know, at least for me, gave me a sense of like, what are the ultimate limits of, of fair electric stability in materials? Uh, and, and they said, you know, um, you know, I, I often remember this paper for kind of setting the baseline, like how thin can we go, you know, uh, uh, in these materials. But they have some very nice points in here as well that say, you know, if you think about the depolarization field, um, you know, well above the critical thickness, the depolarization fields reduce the amplitude of the spontaneous polarization. And again, this is something we've known for, for a few decades at this point, but we're seeing this play out in a very important way. If we're really going to try to make devices out of these uh, materials going forward, we really have to solve this kind of problem, right? And, and the oxide electrodes that we've been relying on when we're dealing with slightly thicker films, right, maybe 100 nanometers or more, may not be adequate to, to really deal with this in the long term, right? So while well, these oxide electrodes have solved many problems, problems like imprint and fatigue and retention and, and similar sorts of effects, are they really going to be good enough in the ultra thin limit or are there ways that we can kind of, you know, adjust the material or these interfaces to, to get better behavior? And there's some ideas out there in the literature already. Uh, and I think people are starting to look into this more. Okay. Now, this energy and voltage uh, aspect is only one part of the equation. Uh, we also have to think about how fast this thing can go. Uh, and so we did some work to look at the switching speeds inside of these materials. So we did pulse switching studies. This is kind of the, what the raw data kind of looks like. So this is switched polarization as a function of uh, time uh, at various applied uh, uh, electric fields in this system. And these barium titanate films are ca capable of a pretty fast switching. Um, this is work that was done, um, you know, here at, at Berkeley. Uh, you know, Ramesh's group is looking a lot at the bismuth ferrite system and, and related ones. So they had some, you know, uh, similar thickness films that we used as a comparison. So if you look at BFO and lanthanum uh, alloyed BFO and compare that to the barium titanate, you'll see that the barium titanate for the same size capacitors, similar size uh, uh, thicknesses of films um, uh, can switch uh, uh, quite a bit faster. Now, in this case, in these devices, it asymptotes to about two and a half nanoseconds. And that's a little bit, that's much faster than we get in the bismuth ferrite, but it's also limited by the surrounding, you know, electronics of the system, including the oxide metal. So the speed limit for the switching is also going to depend on how good of, of, of electrodes we have in these materials. The ultimate speed limit for the fair electric could be much faster, right? We're just talking about the phonon mode in the system uh, and the speed of sound, but um, we have to deal with this kind of uh, surrounding device structure. Now, uh, in the field, when people have looked at, you know, what, what the, the limits are for this, one of the things they do is they do lateral scaling studies where they change the capacitor size uh, and, and kind of use this to make some estimations for how fast things can switch. Uh, and so we did something similar. And uh, there's a lot of data here. I, uh, again, the orange data here is the barium titanate films from the current work. We're comparing it to the BFO, uh, to some um, different uh, PZT-based systems, uh, and, and just for some comparisons here. Uh, and what we see is something that's pretty nice, right? We can get into the kind of critical uh, switching time regimes, which are less than one nanosecond for these real devices. Uh, at a pretty good sized device, right? So if we have even just 3.5 micron or uh, diameter or smaller device, we can already get into the one nanosecond. Now, if we bring down the driving voltage, that might get a little smaller, but we have a lot of room to work with to kind of scale this into the regimes that the real device uh, engineers might be looking for for these systems. Okay, so there is a pathway to the kind of sub nanosecond uh, low voltage switching that we're expecting uh, and hoping for these materials. Okay, now, could we make a real device from this? And this is very pr preliminary stuff. This is not going to be like the greatest thing we, we will ever done. We have a lot of ways that we can go from here. Uh, but we have done some initial studies of putting this onto um, uh, silicon. And we use some of the strontium titanate um, uh, ST, STO silicon uh, wafers to, to do these sorts of things. So we can grow our barium titanate films on top of strontium ruthenate electrodes on the STO silicon substrates. If you zoom in on this uh, diffraction peak here, that's what you show at the bottom, you'll note that it is a heck of a lot nastier looking than what I showed you before. So uh, remember, there's a couple differences here, right? There's things like large thermal expansion mismatch between the oxide films and the, and the silicon substrate. What we think is happening is we're getting some different orientations. We're getting some out-of-plane oriented polarization, some in-plane oriented polarization, perhaps some other defects in the system as well. But the good news is that when you start to do the properties of these materials, we get reasonably good 
responses. So comparing the same kinds of films, we get similar coercive fields. So we're down in the ballpark of about 15 kilovolts per centimeter. So 150 meg, uh, millivolts for a 100 nanometer thick film very comparable. It is shifted. We think this is coming from this kind of uh, uh, thermal expansion mismatch. Fatigue is good. Retention is good. Everything is looking uh, pretty good. So this is a kind of a first pass of getting this thing onto silicon and it doesn't look too bad. Now we got to get it directly on a channel at some point, but that's where we're going in the future. Okay. So barium titanate, this classic material, if we just kind of apply some of the new approaches that we have to play with these sorts of things, we can uh, uh, really make this an interesting candidate for some of these applications. We can achieve ultra low voltage uh, behavior, sub 100 millivolt behavior. Uh, we find that it doesn't necessarily always follow the classical scaling laws, but that can be to our advantage in some regime. Now we might have to deal with this longer term, but this is a good start. It has a low work of switching, which gets just, if you think about scaling these things down to, to what we would ultimately have in terms of real device sizes into much lower energy per operation than we have currently for these uh, devices. And we can get to relatively fast switching speeds in these materials. I don't think the speed limit's ultimately going to be a problem. It seems like there's also a pathway to at least get this thing onto silicon. And I know there's other people who are really working hard on, on integrating barium titanate directly onto silicon. I think this is a positive direction for the field overall. But this stuff really opens up a whole bunch of new questions for us, which we haven't dealt with. And I'm hoping others will also be thinking about in the coming years, which is now that we're getting into this real kind of playground, how do we even measure the properties of things that are on the order of just 100 nanometers square inside of these systems? How do you measure switching and, and switching speeds without going all the way to integrating these things with, with you know, FETs and this sort of thing? So I think there's a lot of really exciting work to be done at kind of the length scale, energy scale, and time scale limits uh, uh, for these materials uh, as we go forward. Now, one other thing that we're looking at uh, for barium titanate, which is kind of a next step, is, is working on developing freestanding versions of these materials. And we've had some work, one of my former postdocs, David Pesquera, uh, who's now in Barcelona, um, did some wonderful work uh, figuring out ways to release these symmetric trilayer structures from the substrate. This is a you know five millimeter square uh, freestanding film of, of these uh, barium titanate materials. Uh, he looked at the you know, frequency and uh, uh, scaling of electric uh, coercive field in these systems. And he also found that when you go from being an epitaxial film to being one of these freestanding films, you actually change uh, uh, the switching behavior and it's impacted by the mechanical constraints. Uh, and, you know, he applied some of the classical rules here and, and found out that, you know, the scaling exponent beta drops by a factor of two to four from membranes. What this really means is that there's a lower frequency dispersion at the coercive field for these systems. And it suggests that there's a higher domain wall mobility when we have the freestanding versions, when they're released from the substrate overall. He took this one step further and looked at the switching speeds, that's the T here, uh, as a function of coercive voltage for these systems. And he found that as he goes from epitaxial films to the freestanding films, this time goes down. Even if you correct for you know RC time constant differences between devices, this is still an improvement, right? So the membranes require lower energy to move the domain wall. So this is another pathway we could do to drive down these voltages even further. And just to give you a sense of where we're at today, we can now transfer uh, films like this and then pattern devices on the top. We can mill all the way down to the bottom electrode or all the way down uh, to the substrate, leaving just cans of these different types of structures. And we have a, a, a kind of a, a wide array of different device structures that we can make. We can make them and then transfer them. We can transfer it and then make them. There's different pathways to do this. And we're kind of excited about what this kind of transferring of freestanding membranes could mean for, for the future of these devices as well. Okay. All right, so that's the end of the first vignette here. Uh, we looked at just be a barium titanate by itself. Uh, and now I wanna shift gears just a little bit and think about what could be done if we mix barium titanate into these kind of super lattice structures uh, and what kind of uh, interesting things can evolve there. And I'll make sure I wrap up in a reasonable time here. Okay, so uh, I think if we look back historically, there's a lot of really interesting things that have happened in super lattices. Uh, and you know, the hottest you know, uh, thing in the recent years has been lead titanate, strontium titanate, and actually for, for a number of years at this point, where we've seen lots of novel effects come out of these materials. Uh, if you go back into the uh, you know, early 2000s, in these really short period super lattices, just a handful of unit cells of each, um, people observe kind of this 
uh, interesting new ferroelectric order, like improper ferroelectricity. This is really dominated by interfacial and strain effects in materials. If you fast forwarded a handful of years uh, and looked at slightly more longer period super lattices, here people can create these kind of beautiful classical flux closure structures uh, where electrostatic and strain energies uh, affect the system. Uh, and then more recently, uh, we've seen that if you make kind of intermediate period super lattices and kind of put these energies into competition, you can get these weird things like these vortices and skirmions uh, forming in these systems where there's a strong competition between different types of energy in these materials. So these Super lattices give us a lot, lots of exciting uh, uh, opportunities. So uh, in the barium titanate, strontium titanate world, uh, we were motivated by um, Robert Wexler and Andrew Rapp at the University of Pennsylvania, who a few years back came to us with this very rough kind of calculation where they started putting barium titanate, strontium titanate, super lattices together and started seeing similar kinds of weird uh, polar structures forming, uh, something akin to like a vortex or maybe a, 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 these interesting up and down uh, dipolar structures in these materials. So we went to the literature and, you know, it's been really widely studied. People have made um, uh, these super lattices of barium titanate, strontium titanate for, for many, many years. I referenced just a few of the papers here in this field. A lot of the early work was looking to, you know, kind of enhance the remnant polarization of BST, um, you know, maybe produce exotic domain walls or polarization and a whole bunch of other stuff. Now, the earlier work was generally on relatively thicker films, you know, maybe in the hundreds to, to 700 nanometers. There were some simulations, um, but even from the earliest reports, and I, and I provide just a couple of them here, there were some hints of really kind of interesting exotic things happening, including strong frequency dispersion of the dielectric response inside of these materials when they made uh, even multi-layer and super lattice versions of these, of these structures. Uh, so there were hints of kind of relaxer-like order, but no real explanation explanation for the mechanism of what's going on. All right, so where did we come in? Well, now we can do these kinds of things where we use things like reflection, high energy electron diffraction, assisted PLD uh, to make these things happen. Those uh, uh, who, who may be curious, we, we shine the laser in, we have different targets of the material. Uh, we can ablate the material from the target. Uh, we can switch between targets and grow uh, different layers of these materials, all the while sending in a beam of electrons at a glancing angle. We can collect uh, uh, on a phosphor screen, those uh, diffracted and reflected electrons, and we end up with this pattern, and we can monitor that pattern as a function of time. Uh, every time we see an oscillation in the intensity of the system, we've grown a single layer. So this is an example for the lead titanate, strontium titanate. This is how we can grow these super lattice structures. All right, so we started doing this for um, the barium titanate, strontium titanate, with a goal of really focusing in at the kind of short end of this, right? Just a few unit cells for these materials. So this is kind of a schematic illustration of what we've done for these things. They're gonna start with strontium titanate, end with strontium titanate, and have barium titanate, strontium titanate alternating inside. So we can grow nice versions of these materials. This is a typical uh, read pattern for a couple periods of these systems. Uh, so we can grow the strontium titanate layers, barium titanate, strontium titanate, and the like. We can then zoom in after the fact. This is a, a, a scanning transmission electron microscopy image where we see that we can make these very nice uh, super lattice structures. So, so everything kind of consistent with what we've seen before. Now we did this for a whole range of, of things. Uh, so this N value here that you see is the number of unit cells. So we're going from four, five, six, eight, 10, 12, 16, 20, and the like. You can see the evolution of the uh, uh, system overall, the evolution of the super lattice peaks in the system as we change the periodicity. So everything looks pretty good uh, as, as we make these materials. We then make devices out of these things. Um, we've been spending a lot of time on, on fabrication approaches recently to try to make these things so we can have really stable measurements. If anybody's curious about how we do this, we even use these things in synchrotrons now. I'm happy to talk about these sorts of things as well, but we can have these setups where we can have capacitor structures where we can actually interrogate them remotely by wire bonding to a pad that's held separate from it. So we can really kind of let these things be off by themselves and, and do their do their work. And these work really well for temperature dependent studies, which is what I'm gonna show you. All right, so we did some uh, polarization electric field hysteresis loops. What we see uh, is effectively no hysteresis. We see a uh, relatively small remnant polarization, reasonably strong uh, saturation polarizations. And if we can compare this to say a parent version, this is a, just a, um, a solid solution of barium strontium titanate. Uh, 
we see that we're starting to trend towards that as we go to thinner and thinner super lattice periods in the system. Now, the interesting part uh, was what happened when we looked at the dielectric permittivity as a function of temperature. And again, at the bottom here, we're starting with large periods, 20, all the way down to uh, n equals four. This is four unit cells of each. And what we see is that there's a strong frequency uh, dependence to the dielectric behavior in these materials. So while the majority of these thicker ones have a relatively fat, flat response, uh, these thinner ones are looking more and more like a non-ferroelectric interesting kind of material. So uh, before we call it a relaxer, we should probably do a, some, a little bit more due diligence on these sorts of things. So we apply vulgar Fulcher fitting uh, to try to assess uh, what's happening in these systems. So we can look at the evolution, the frequency dependence of the, of, of the response in these materials uh, as a function of periodicity. We did it for all of them, but just for clarity, I've only shown a few of them here. Um, so we can fit these sorts of things. There's a lot of information here, but let me just kind of summarize it quickly. If you look at the n equals 6, 8, 16, this kind of range, what we end up with are both activation fields, freezing temperatures, uh, and, um, uh, you know, um, frequencies, characteristic frequencies for these systems that are similar to what we've seen in other kind of uh, relaxed materials. However, when we get to the n equals four system, something bizarre happens. The activation energy is quite odd, right? So it has an unphysically large uh, uh, characteristic frequency. It has a large increase in the coercive field, uh, in, in the activation energy field for the system, and a decrease in the freezing temperature for the system. And if we compare that to something like the BST 6040, which is actually a pretty robust, you know, ferroelectric in these systems, it looks more like this, but it shows dielectric properties that look a lot more like a relaxer in the system. What we think is happening, we're going to talk about this a bit more as we go through, is that there's a relatively tight distribution of kind of slush-like polar structures inside of these materials. It's not really a relaxer, but it's not really a ferroelectric either. It's got some kind of weird kind of physics happening inside of these materials. So it's something like an artificially relaxer-like response in the super lattice materials. Okay, now to help us understand this weird thing, uh, we went back to, to Robert and, and Andrew uh, and I would just give a plug for Robert, who, who's soon starting as a, as a faculty member himself at, at Wash U uh, for doing wonderful, uh, um, you know, molecular dynamic simulations to help us really understand what's going on. So in the next couple of slides, I'm really going to highlight their, their work. Uh, and so they were able to uh, take a deep dive into the structural snapshots of what's going on and looking at the polarization as the function of time and temperature in a, in a reasonably good sized unit cell for this, this system. Uh, and I'm going to summarize a lot of this work relatively quickly here. So uh, they start looking at the n equals four super lattice, where we see these interesting kinds of things happen, and they see the following evolution with temperature. So they see that we start at low temperatures in kind of a classic dipolar, you know, structure where we have up and down domains inside of these materials, these striped domains. As you increase the temperature, those domains start to grow. They eventually start to change direction in the system, and then when we hit about about 110K in the MD simulations, they kind of start to fall apart into these kind of slush-like polar structures. And this looks a heck of a lot like what a relaxer looks like inside of these materials, right? So the presence of this super lattice is kind of destabilizing the polarization and leading this to happen. And they can extract a, a freezing temperature that's quite akin to what we get in, in the experiment. Now, if you start to increase the thickness, you go to six and equal six, similar kind of behavior but it doesn't transition into the relaxer phase until higher temperatures. You have thicker versions of the material, it takes longer time to de decorrelate them and destabilize them. And if you go all the way out to N equals 16, here they're thick enough that it's always a ferroelectric. There's some different types of behavior uh, as you go through uh, uh, the temperature for the system, but it's thick enough that the barium titanate always wants to be like barium titanate, like a, like a bulk ferroelectric. So the confinement of the barium titanate layers in this dielectric is inducing this instability of the polarization. We can take advantage of that. Uh, it wants to be polar, but these boundary conditions seem to be preventing it from having this long range uh, kind of condensation of, of, of polar structures that we're used to when you're below a critical temp thickness and temperature in the system. All right. Um, and so it seems like an artificial route to, to induce something like relaxer behavior in these materials. You can effectively use the super lattice to tune these short and long range order overall.
All right, so this is kind of cool. We can get these kinds of interesting th things happening. Now, to, to extract a bit more information about what's going on and put some more quantitation to uh, quantitative understanding to it, uh, Robert and company came up with this really interesting way of using what are called 2D discrete wavelet transformations um, to explore the dynamics of the system. So I'm briefly going to teach you what this is and then show you what, what comes out of it. So these have been used to examine uh, fractal self-similarity in, in materials. This has actually been observed in relaxers before. Um, and you can pull out interesting numbers, including um, uh, the medium absolute deviation of what's called the diagonal detail in the system. This is a coefficient that effectively tells you about the noise level inside of these uh, uh, 2D systems in this, in this material. And so we can use this to extract un understanding. So what you can do is make, say, a hypothetical polarization map. So this is like the outer plane polarization looking down at a surface. It could be purple pointing down, yellow pointing up. And then we can apply uh, these 2D uh, discrete wavelet transformations to do these sorts of things. I'm not going to go into the math here. Uh, we're working on the story right now. Uh, but basically, you can pull out four different coefficients. And this diagonal detail coefficient is one that gives us a lot of information about the noise in the system. All right, so this is going to be a way for us to get information about the spatial order uh, in a 2D image. So what does this kind of polar noise level, sigma n, really mean? Well, you can do different examples. We could take a, you know, kind of a classic example of a stripe domain. So this is our polarization structure here in the first image. We can apply these sorts of things and extract these coefficients. What it does for these sorts of things is it says, well, you know, it's effectively only not zero uh, near the domain walls. So where there's large gradients in polarization inside of these materials. Um, so the, um, you know, they're less noisy when they're inside the domains, and we only see this variation near the boundary. If you take a completely random polarization profile, right, so something like a paraelectric, you can do this again. Uh, and what we'll find now is that uh, that this noise coefficient is much larger, has a much bigger spread. It's centered about zero, which tells us it's truly random noise, but it gives us a sense of, of what's going on in these materials. So it's a, basically a way of quantitatively measuring how disordered ordered you are inside of your system, so how relaxerish you are. Okay, so what can we do? So what Robert came up with was he said, let me set some bounds. I can take a purely ferroelectric polarization profile here in the upper uh, uh, left. This is all polarization pointing in one direction. It's a monodomain ferroelectric. He calculates this coefficient. It ends up being zero. And you can say that this thing is essentially noiseless. There's no noise to this. So that's the, that's the floor for what we can get. Now, if you go to the other end of the spectrum, if you do this for a paraelectric, which is this random polarization, you calculate this, the coefficient is much larger. Here it's about 1.23 in, in the units of this system. Uh, and this gives us kind of a bound. So this is our range from purely ordered to purely random. And then we can do this for something like a relaxer, which has these local polar structures in these materials. Uh, and what we find is that uh, First, these things evolve with time, as you would expect. There's some dynamics associated with them, and they come up with values that are intermediate to those two before. All right, so this gives us a sense of what we have. So now what we've done is we can assess the different super lattice structures and understand what's going on. So this is this noise value on the vertical axis, or all normalized to one for the systems, okay? Going from the n equals four to n equals six to n equals 16. And so what we see is that in the n equals 16, Strontium titanate pretty much acts like uh, a nonpolar system, and the barium titanate pretty much acts like a uni uniform uh, ferroelectric system. But when you get to the lower period super lattice structures, you see that you get these intermediate values, and there's some disorder associated with these sorts of things. It's something more akin to like a relaxer phase happening inside these n equal four and n equal six super lattices uh, uh, above this T freezing temperature. So these right boundary conditions are inducing the kinds of disorder and instability in the ferroelectricity, which are producing new types of, uh, of behavior. Uh, so you know we can produce. So effects that are akin to chemical disorder using super lattice structures and in, in, in part this kind of artificial relaxer behavior to these systems. All right, and so with that, I'll wrap up. Um, uh, this is just the final slide here. I'll say, you know, even in these old materials, we can often find new possibilities uh, and, and new applications. And, you know, applying our new approaches is, uh, is often going to give us new insights that can really make some, some impact for this. So thank you for your time. I'll be happy to answer any questions. And, uh, you know, thanks for joining us. 
Fantastic. Thank you so much, Lane. So we have time for some uh, questions and uh, discussion, and we're starting to get some uh, typed in uh, by the audience. I, I, I uh, want to start. Uh, let me ask a question first. Take the sure. <laughs> The uh, prerogative. So, so uh, I think you're. Uh, we're talking exclusively about uh, uh, systems where you electroded um, across the uh, across the film in the expected kind of way, where you have the polarization perpendicular to the film. Yeah. But yeah. if you had the polarization parallel to the film, it seems like a lot of these depolarization field uh, issues would go away. And then you have, of course, the technical problem of how do you electrode that uh, properly. But some people tell me that's not impossible to do. Uh, but do you have any yeah. comments on, on that? Yeah, your, 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 your thoughts are good ones and so good that we've also been looking at that, <laughs> <laughs> at that for, for a similar reason. And um, uh, there's some added benefits there as well in the sense that you can then make um, multi-layer structures where you can also get multiple switching behavior. So you can almost have these two layers. They're not completely independent, but you can actually get them pretty close to be. One will switch at one voltage, another switch at a different voltage. So there are some interesting things you can do in the in-plane uh, direction. Making very small devices is challenging in that, in that, uh, but it's not impossible. And I think you know what you've heard is correct. And I think there's a lot to be done in that direction. I, I, we're we we are literally working on a story right now uh, in, in that in that same sense. So okay, good, great, look, great look minds think alike. <laughs> look, look for it. Look forward to it. Maybe we can do uh, some. Uh, a theorist can do some uh, simulations for that uh, yeah, too. Yeah. And I would yeah. say, you know, on that one, Ron, you know, the concept of having, you know, like in magnetism, right? We have exchange mm -hmm. bias, right? Where mm -hmm. you have an anti ferro uh, magnet coupling to ferro magnets, and you can have right. effects on how this, how switching happens. You know, is there something akin to this in the ferroelectric system, right? Are there, is there electrostatic coupling at these interfaces that can mm -hmm. lead to changes in how you switch the properties and switch the behavior of these materials? I think that's, that, that could be very cool. Okay, let me read some of the questions from the sure. audience. So uh, for Mario's... Uh, oh, I have article. them up, Ron, so you don't have to read Oh, yeah, yeah. Just, okay. I can read them. Well, you yeah. should read it too then so that yeah, you can yeah. hear what the question is. Okay, okay so great. this is from Mario's. Uh, he's saying in the early 2000s, uh, Marty Gregg's group showed some uh, relaxed behavior in BSTO samples, I agree, due to these Maxwell-Wagner relations. Um, uh, in, in these systems, you know, varying leakage characteristics from layer to layer, so on and so forth. You know, have we been thinking about these? Yeah, in fact, we have, right? We've been we've been looking at these. I didn't show a lot of the um, frequency dependent uh, dielectric response that that we've done, but underneath that that temperature dependent dielectric data that I showed you, we have um, looked very carefully for these sorts of things. We don't see a lot of it right now. We we we've seen and we had definitely have films where we have Maxwell Wagner kind of roll off happening in these things, and we don't see that happening in in these systems. They they seem to be pretty insulating for us, um, and we don't see a dramatic change uh, with the periodicity in that. So. While we're keen to kind of make sure we exclude those effects, I, I think right now we don't think that's the dominant effect in, in the system. So that, that'd be my first answer to this one. Um, uh, do I know why the stripe to diagonal domain uh, transition happens in the, in the system? Uh, off the top of my head, I don't remember the exact uh, reasoning for this. I think as the, uh, maybe just to speculate a little bit here, you know, as we're changing the temperature and as the stability of the polarization is changing, it's possible that the, 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 the you know, stable direction of the polarization is starting to change. So at lower temperatures, it's robustly in you know, you know, a tetragonal version, but as it starts to heat up and get closer to the transition temperature, maybe it's a little bit more flexible in, in these sorts of things. I don't have a great answer for you right off the top of the head, but I'll, I'll talk with Robert and, and my student uh, uh, who are working on this. And, and that's, a, that's a good question. Um, Okay, there's another question about frequency dependence in epsilon and relaxer superlupus in the uh, computations. Uh, that's a great question. Uh, I think we'd have to ask Robert and, and um, Andrew, as far as I know, they have not done the full calculation of, of the dielectric response yet, but it's something they've done in the past. Um, these were pretty hefty calculations and, and getting into this discrete wavelet transformation stuff took quite a bit of time to kind of understand. We were trying to figure out how to better quantify, you know, relaxer disorder in these in these materials. So we haven't we haven't done that fully yet, but it's a it's a great idea and something we could we could definitely look into. 
Uh, I don't want to commit Andrew and Robert to something uh, while they're not here, perhaps. <laughs> um, OK, two questions for the next person. Uh, like you know, Hafnium oxide instead of barium titanate. Um, uh, what would be the main issue of using barium titanate as an oxide layer? OK, this is a great question. So the hafnia, I think, you know, like everybody else, we're also looking at hafnia for the same same reasons, right? You know, the course of voltage and field for that system, you know, the course of fields are very large, of course. Um, so this is one of the reasons why we're looking into this alternative direction. We also have a little bit of motivation. Maybe I'll just tell you why we're doing it, and then I can tell you about what the differences are. So we also have some motivation from some work we're doing with, with uh, some folks in industry uh, to look at, you know, coupling this to oxide channels uh, to make FET. So not just using silicon, but also considering other types of channel materials where the perovskites might be a, a good match. So, so there is some at least initial motivation to look at that. I think the biggest issue for the barium titanate is going to be, while there's some wonderful work happening on trying to integrate the barium titanate directly onto silicon, right, uh, through MBE growth and things like this, that, that's been quite challenging, right? So the films look good, but maybe the properties don't look as great. So I think if we get a little bit better at doing those sorts of things as a community, this should be in the game. The Hafnia, that's a kind of a no brainer, right? We know how to do the Hafnia systems already. So I think they have the leg up on these sorts of things, but this is where we're coming from. Um, there is no, uh, the second question, is there a wake up effect uh, in the barium titanate films compared to the hafnia? And, and there's not, right? So right out of the box, right? As soon as we make it, it looks, it looks the same and, and it looks the same after we've done a billion cycles for these sorts of things. So we are not seeing, at least with the oxide electrodes we're using, any sort of wake up effect uh, in our films, even in, in, the, thin, in the thin ones. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, another question about, um, the switching behavior in the barium titanate system. So uh, it says for bulk barium titanate, coarse field could be low due to polarization virtual via domain formation and propagation is the same mechanism for thin films uh, with low coarse field. Uh, yeah, as best we can tell, um, it's got, you know, it's, it's fit by uh, uh, KAI kind of switching approaches, right? So those assume a certain type of switching behavior in the system. And uh, as best we can tell, we think that's happening. However, one thing I will say, and this is not, we haven't been able to directly probe this yet, but this is something we, we're speculating on. I think it's, this is our best guess right now. So when we make the freestanding versions of these materials, we see that the switching time and the switching fields go down uh, in these systems. So when we take it off the substrate, there we think it is actually perhaps no longer doing a direct 180 degree switch, but doing a 90-90 a switch in the system. And we have a tendency to, to believe at this point based on a number of observations that these sequential 90 degree ferroelastic switches might have lower energy barriers than a single 180 degree switch. And so by releasing it from the substrate, uh, we now enable it to undergo different switching pathways. So we think when it's on the substrate, it can never go in plane polarization. So it has to go from up to down. But when it's freestanding, it might have the option to do 90-90 and, and that might give us uh, a lower uh, field. So that's speculative. We, we hope to do those kinds of direct measurements on the switching pathway, but we just haven't done them yet. Um, so there may be a different pathway in, in that regard. Um, Okay, so uh, someone's asking in the Volker Fulcher fitting for the for the um, material, there were some unusual activation energies, right? Um, so for the pure BST sixty forty film, uh, that thing is not truly a relaxer. It's it's kind of ferroelectrically at at um, you know at in in the measurements, and so. Uh, applying the vulgar Fulcher fitting kind of fails, right? Because it, it ha it, it's not truly in a relaxer. It doesn't have this kind of like sloshy, you know, glassy kind of behavior and these sorts of things. We were using it only as a, a comparison because the N equal four was so bizarre and not like a normal relaxer. We had to have some context for, for what was going on. So we kind of agree with what, what you're saying here that that does not look like a traditional relaxer material. There, there's something different here. And these kind of nonsensical frequency values and, and very large activation values are 
suggestive, not of kind of like a, you know, uh, a relaxer kind of, you know, multiple kinds of transition things happening, but something more akin to like a ferroelectric. So these N equal four samples, the super lattices, we think are somewhere between like a relaxer and a ferroelectric. I, I mean, I don't exactly know what to call them, but it looks, it looks quite weird. And I think you're right to, to point out that, that variation. Lane, we're out of time. So sure. we have some more questions. I, I, I encourage you to go ahead and answer those offline by email <laughs> and if you can. Okay. And, uh, and I'm going to have to uh, uh, go ahead, uh, you know, for the people have other things uh, after. And sure. let me just uh, uh, share my, um, share my, uh, my uh, thing here. Thank you, Lane. That was fantastic. I want to encourage everyone, you can look at uh, videos of this and previous uh, talks by going uh, to the website and, um, and uh, which is listed in the uh, email for uh, the registrations. I don't have the link for today's talk in there yet. And then we have talks for the next two months lined up on June 9th. Uh, uh, Rama uh, Vasudevan from uh, Oak Ridge National Lab and July 14th, uh, Max Stengel uh, from uh, uh, Spain. And uh, so uh, we're really looking forward to those. And uh, we want to thank all of you for participating. We're still getting like 100 people uh, to uh, participate each month. So it seems like there is an interest, even though uh, people are going to live meetings still as well. So uh, if, you, if you're busy uh, uh, with other things that so you can't uh, attend the live talk, you can always uh, look at the video. So thank you again, Lane, it was fantastic. And uh, with that, we'll uh, sign off uh, for today. Uh, so goodbye, everyone. Yeah, and, and then yes. if I didn't answer your question, please feel free to email me and, and I'll, I'll try to do so. Bye, everybody. Okay. Thank you.